Good afternoon. Um, I would like to, take, uh, to thank the SAGES platform, as well as Dr. Goldblatt and Dr. Slater for giving us this opportunity to uh, present. Um, I'm going to talk about um, the indications and current uh, uh, use of mesh versus uh, tissue repair in inguinal hernia repair in adults. I have no disclosures. Uh, growing hernia uh, raphis, like um, Dr. Higgins mentioned a, a little bit ago, um, performed worldwide um, in vast numbers, almost 20 million per year, with higher uh, lifetime risk in men than women, and majority of them being symptomatic and needing repair. Um, surgical management of inguinal hernia repairs, however, over the years has gone through various um, evolutions, with the primary goal of um, the different iterations being minimal morbidity with low recurrence, and that was was the aim we've been trying to achieve over the years. Um, there are actually more than 70 different types of named tissue repairs in the literature over the years. Um, but pure tissue uh, hernia repair was first introduced uh, all the way back to the 1500s. Um, we all know Bassini um, repair, which was first performed in the 1887s, um, involved uh, posterior inguinal uh, canal reinforcement using transversalis fascia, the transverse abdominis muscle, inter internal oblique muscle uh, with no mesh uh, being repaired. However, in the hands of less experienced surgeons had a higher rate of recurrence, and so um, Scholdeis as well as McVeigh tried to um, have different iterations or variations of it. Uh, however, the recurrence rates were still high in the range of 10 to 15 percent, which then led to the tension-free uh, Liechtenstein repair with mesh uh, that was introduced in 1980s. Uh, this eliminated the need to pull fascia layers together, uh, putting them under tension, and reduced uh, the uh, recurrence risk by 50 to 75 percent, which uh, was a huge feat. So what are the current recommendations for mesh and non-mesh repair for adult inguinal hernia in the current era? Um, this was a paper that was published by the Mike Rosen Group from Cleveland, where they did a review of the inguinal hernia repair techniques within the American Hernia Society Quality Collaborative, uh, where they looked at the uh, trends of uh, surgeons who perform um, adult inguinal hernia repairs for um, unilateral, uncomplicated inguinal hernias, um, and looked at the 30-day outcomes and one-year recurrence rates um, in 2019. They included 4,600 patients. Um, about 42% of those cases were performed open. About 40% were laparoscopic and 18% robotic. Um, so one third of the MIS techniques were performed robotically. The shoulder ice technique remains the most common tissue-based repair that's performed, which accounted for about 77% of the open tissue-based repairs. And the Lichtenstein repair was the most common open mesh-based repair, which accounted for about 57% of those cases. Out of the open inguinal uh, hernia repairs that were reported in the database, 92% of those cases um, actually used mesh, and about 8% were tissue-based. So in the adult population, which is different than the pediatrics that was presented earlier, the majority of uh, time uh, mesh reinforcement is um, applied in uh, uh, the inguinal hernia repairs. The one-year recurrence data, however, in this study was very limited by the fact that they only had about a 10% follow-up um, for their patients. Um, the largest meta-analysis regarding mesh versus non-mesh um, inguinal hernia, uh, femoral hernia repairs was uh, published by uh, the Cochrane uh, uh, database. Um, and the original paper was written in 2002 with a review paper that was also published in 2018. They included 25 studies, studies which had about 6,293 participants. Uh, the studies uh, were, uh, included trials that were randomized into mesh versus non-mesh inguinal hernia or femoral hernia repairs and looked at adults over the age of 18. Uh, the outcomes evaluated recurrence, perioperative complications, duration of operation, hospital stay, and time to return to uh, daily activities. In the uh, mesh repair uh, groups, they found that uh, those patients had shorter hospital stays by about uh, 0.6 days, um, faster return to normal daily activities by almost about three days. Um, they also noted that they had, in the, in the meta-analysis, that they had reduced risk of hematoma formation and reduced risk of urinary retention. 
Um, however, the mesh group had a higher uh, risk of seroma formation as well as wound infection as well. In the tissue-based repair groups, um, they, um, which is similar to what Dr. Higgins presented here as well, higher rate of neurovascular and visceral um, uh, injuries and um, uh, perioperative short-term pain as well. The, however, the one thing we'll mention here is when it comes to chronic pain, which you know lasts for more than um, three months, they were not able to definitively um, say which group had a higher rate of chronic pain issues, due to the fact that people had very various ways of uh, very different ways of reporting chronic pain. In the 2002 uh, version of the paper, uh, the Cochrane Review paper, lower chronic pain was seen in the MESH group. However, um, in um, the 2018 iteration, um, the difference in reporting of pain w would not allow them to be able to be definitive on this data. Um, looking at recurrence rate, um, as you can see here, uh, mesh repair reduced the risk of hernia recurrence with a relative, uh, with a risk ratio of 0.46, um, which is consistent with what we know with adults. Um, the International Guidelines for Groin Hernia Management, which was published by the Hernia um, Surge Group and was uh, mentioned earlier as well, talks about the uh, possible indications and indications for mesh versus uh, tissue-based repair, and we're going to go through some of the, their recommendations. When it comes to mesh versus non-mesh repair in adults, um, the group does recommend a mesh-based repair technique for patients with inguinal hernias in the adult population, and this was a strong recommendation from them. Um, however, a non-mesh repair inguinal hernia can be suggested in cases where either uh, the patient refuses or with discussion with their surgeon based on the patient's specific desire. Um, when it comes to influence of mesh weight choice, um, because sometimes there's not a clear delineation of what we call lightweight mesh and uh, heavyweight mesh, um, they recommend not basing the choice of mesh solely based on the, the, whether the mesh was labeled as a lightweight versus heavyweight. And this is due to the fact that the pore size of the mesh also matters a lot in the way that the, the mesh incorporates into um, the surrounding structures. So macroporous meshes have a much better ability to incorporate into surrounding structures. So they said um, just using the weight of the mesh is not, is not recommended for them. And this is one of their um, uh, stronger, strongest recommendations as well. Um, when considering uh, post-operative pain after inguinal hernia repair, um, they suggested that uh, low weight um, uh, meshes especially in the setting of an open inguinal hernia repair, might be something that we can consider because there might be some benefits in um, short-term uh, pain profile, especially less than three months compared to the heavyweight me uh, meshes. And another uh, concept they also brought was in open case especially, um, the sensation of a foreign body um, might be more uh, prominent in heavyweight meshes that might be used than a lightweight. So they, so they recommended potentially considering the uh, lightweight meshes in this um, setting. Uh, when it comes to mesh fixation in the minimally invasive approaches for inguinal hernia repairs, um, in almost all cases, any type of mesh fixation in the TEP repair is unnecessary. The one area where they um, talked about um, the benefit of using mesh fixation is in patients that have large direct hernias, uh, which are M3s. In these cases, they have a higher uh, risk of a, a hernia recurrence on the medial aspect of where we place the mesh. So they said uh, medial fixation of the mesh would be um, uh, recommended in these, in these groups. Um, atraumatic mesh fixation techniques are favored to reduce early post-operative pain instead of permanent tax and uh, sutures uh, putting those at um, atraumatic uh, mesh fixations such as fibrin sealants have shown um, reduced early post-operative pain but no difference in chronic pain. Uh, when it comes to emergency inguinal hernia repairs in adults, there is a paucity of data um, in terms of mesh utilization versus not. 
um, especially when we're talking about the different classes of uh, uh, wound. In class one and two uh, wound uh, uh, classifications, where you have either a clean or clean contaminated cases, a monofilament, large pore, polypropylene mesh, uh, uh, polypropylene based mesh is suggested in emergent groin hernia cases, just like we would be doing in the elective inguinal hernia um, cases. Um, some of the debate comes in when we're talking about class three more than anything else. In class four, especially, I think there is some con clear consensus that you do not want to put any kind of mesh in a dirty uh, field um, since your risk of mesh infection requiring explantation and uh, more issues with patients is much higher. But for this group, uh, both class three and class four wound classification, they suggested um, steering away from using uh, mesh in um, emergent settings. Um, however, However, there are some surgeons, and we've seen it in some of the hernia debates that we've had at this conference, um, who would consider putting um, meshes in some class three wounds as long as what they call con the contamination to be minimal, where there was not a lot of spillage, but um, as an overall official recommendation, they um, recommend steering away from mesh placement in class three and four wounds. So besides um, uh, the factors that I talked about um, so far, there are other factors that might affect the decision to use mesh versus not in inguinal hernias. And that is one, the local resources um, of your area or even country might make a big difference. Um, there are literature that reports that about zero to 5% uh, use of mesh seen in low resource areas versus 95% in settings with highest resources. So whether you actually have access to the meshes to be placed or not might actually dictate whether you're going to do a tissue-based versus mesh repair. Um, some mesh-related lawsuits, even though we see these more often in the gynecologic um, complications, still can put some fear in both the surgeons as well as the patients as to whether they want to have a foreign body that, um, that needs to be placed, more so in areas where the wound classification is, steers away from class one uh, on the surgeon's side, or in other settings, you might have patients that just refuse to have foreign bodies that are going to be placed in them. So as a surgeon, that conversation with your patient about what they're willing to have done uh, with the understanding of risk benefit uh, discussion becomes very important in um, which approach you're going to use and whether you're going to put a mesh in or not. So in summary, uh, the fact that so many different repairs are still done, um, in some cases mesh being placed, other times uh, not, strongly suggests that a, a best repair method for all inguinal hernias does not exist. Um, and so there has to be some um, comfort level with the different repair types from the surgeon side, as well as a conversation on the, pa the patient presentation that might lead you for one repair and um, might lead you for mesh use versus tissue repair. A use of a large pore monofilament polypropylene mesh in adult inguinal hernia repair significantly reduces um, recurrence rate and used, is used prevalently um, whenever available um, in the current age as well. In minimally invasive inguinal hernia repairs, mesh fixation is not necessary except in large direct um, um, hernias, M3 type hernias. And your local regional um, resources, wound contamination classifications, and the patient refusal for placement of mesh might be other influences that might um, help steer um, which direction you're going to do in terms of mesh placement versus tissue repair. Thank you.